I'm going to steer you towards is the teaching of the Buddha, which happened before Buddhism was invented. Buddhism was invented hundreds of years after the Buddha died. And the Buddha's teaching was based upon direct experience of the reality of life through Vipassana meditation. He wanted people not to have an idea or a philosophy, but to meditate, gain an experience, and from their experience, live a good life. Vipassana is a tool for seeing realistically and living well. It's inward, interior, self-observation on a naturally occurring, ordinary object called sensations. To observe them neutrally, without commenting on them, without reacting to the sensations of your body. Vipassana meditation means systematic, continuous, thorough observation. The practice is to observe sensations, and sensations includes the ordinary sensations, like feeling a little cold, or feeling your seat against the chair. It does include those things because we edit nothing out. But if you observe systematically, thoroughly, and continuously, an entirely new world of sensations opens up to you. As you practice Vipassana over time, there's a whole realm of sensations in your body that you've never been previously aware of and you've come to recognize that your entire body is continuously filled with many, many varieties, intensities, types of sensations simultaneously, continuously, all the time. In fact, even when you're asleep, although typically we're not aware of that. Now that sounds fairly easy. I think it also sounds fairly boring. So we're going to have to figure out why it's worth doing. If you take a 10-day Vipassana meditation course, and in our tradition all the courses are taught only in 10 days, if you sit down and try to meditate, the very first thing that happens, you'll meditate for somewhere between 1 and 10 seconds, and then you'll just start daydreaming. And the reason is our minds are trained to look out into the world. We're constantly dealing coping, strategizing, planning. We are very successful monkeys. We know how to make the world work for us. So when you sit down and close your eyes to meditate, this strategizing monkey, who you have been for your whole life, just starts strategizing. And he or she, the monkey in your mind, starts thinking of all the things that you want to do, should do, are planning to do that will feel good. And you will also start thinking about all the things that you don't want to happen, that you better head off, that you better prevent. Craving, I want this, I have to plan to get this. And aversion, oh my God, that better not happen, I better do this to prevent it. Strategizing and planning is a good thing to do. But meditating is something different. And when you start to meditate, you're stuck with your strategizing and planning mind. That's why we teach meditation in 10 days. It takes a while. And in fact, we start teaching Vipassana with a simplified form of Vipassana, in which instead of trying to feel sensations throughout your entire body, you try to feel sensations just in the area of your nose as you breathe in and out. So Vipassana is taught starting in a simple way, and then the practice is expanded with very careful teaching over a period of 10 days to help you get the hang of it, to help you overcome the previous tendencies of the mind to daydream, and to get you to observe your body systematically and thoroughly. There's another part of the practice that helps reduce the strategizing, planning, worrying, natural product of the way we live and to reorient the mind towards meditation itself. And that is taking ethical precepts, ethical attitudes. Before we start meditating, we take a decision, we take vows. Vows is a very old fashioned word. So I say we take a decision not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, not to use intoxicants, which includes tobacco, 
and not to commit sexual misconduct, which for the 10 days of a course, that means everybody comes alone, you come as an individual person. So there's no sexual behavior at all. The rest of your life, of course, you do as you please. In the 10 day course, you've prepared yourself with these ethical vows. You start with this simplified form of Vipassana and you're building up the capacity to be aware, awakeful, self-observing, and particularly to focus on sensations. What is the point of focusing on sensations anyway? The mind is in the body. Meditation is development of the mind through the awareness of its embodied nature. The mind occurs in the body and there are aspects of your mind that you can only access by becoming aware of the sensations of the body that the mind is receiving. So actually, when you're observing sensations of the body, you're not just observing the body. The observing property is the mind. As you're observing the mind, you're observing the body. As you're observing the body, it is the mind that is doing the observing. So the two cannot be separated. And as you're developing the observation of sensation, you're developing your mind. And particularly, you're developing these qualities of your mind. You're an ethical person who's taken these ethical vows. You're sitting there peacefully, self-contented. You're making an attempt to be awake and alert, not to daydream. It's true, you will daydream, but you're making an effort to not daydream. And you're making an effort to have a neutral, non-judgmental, non-editorial, non-sensorial mind, a balanced mind, a calm mind, a peaceful mind. It's a mental, physical exercise in learning to be balanced, calm, peaceful, awake, and observing. It is not an exercise in being cut off from the world. I've just described to you in a rather simple form, a practice that the Buddha taught called Vipassana meditation. But we are not discussing Buddhism. I want to make this point quite clear. There is a misperception that happened in many people's minds, both in the past and in the current time, that if you're following the teaching of the Buddha, you're a Buddhist. That's not true. People who don't want to be Buddhists or who aren't Buddhists or something else already, they're Christians or any other thing, they're free to practice Vipassana without worrying about becoming Buddhists. Because Vipassana is such a natural, simple, obvious, and impersonal teaching, it really doesn't belong to anybody. It doesn't belong to the Buddhists. The Buddha actually claimed he didn't invent it. He claimed he got it from somebody else. And so Vipassana meditation is always taught for free. It's free in the way that breathing is free. Trees give us oxygen and trees don't charge us. If we think of the Buddha as something that the universe manifests, the universe has a voice and speaks and explains what the universe is about, well, that's not going to be taught for a fee. So Vipassana is always taught for free. I learned Vipassana from a teacher named Mr. Goenka. At that time, he was teaching only in India. Since that time, he started teaching throughout the world, and he's asked others to teach on his behalf. You only can learn Vipassana from somebody else. It's a social activity. It's a gift. It's something you get. Vipassana is transmitted person to person. Mr. Goenka transmitted it to approximately one million people. He's had about one million students. But where did he get it? He got it from a teacher in Burma named Uba Ken. Where did he get it? He got it from another teacher. Where did he get it? He got it from another teacher. So for 2,500 years, people have been receiving the pasta, and the only way to learn it was to be a student of somebody else. We get it. And once we have it, if we like it, if we find it valuable, if we enjoy doing it, if we feel it enhances our life, then we try to help transmitting it, that is, passing it on to someone else.